All right, what's going on guys? So in this video, I wanna talk about clean eating. Now, let me start by saying that if you follow clean eating yourself and it's been working well for you and it's something you feel like you can happily stick to, that's totally fine. I do think that nutrition is very individual. So the problems I'm gonna outline here may or may not all apply to all of you. But I do think that there certainly are better approaches to dieting that many people would benefit from hearing about because despite its many drawbacks, clean eating is still extremely popular in the fitness industry today. This was shown just last month in a new survey covered in the latest issue of the Mass Research Review of over a thousand young people aged 14 to 24. Now, 88% of people viewed clean eating as positive, so only 12% saw it as negative. In fact, 71% of people viewed clean eating as entirely healthy with no unhealthy or harmful features. So clearly most people, probably including many of you, still think clean eating is a good idea. And I'll admit that on the surface, it really does seem like an obviously reasonable approach. You just get rid of any dirty junk foods and instead eat clean, nutritious whole foods. What could be the problem with that? Well, even though it seems to make sense on the surface, as we'll see, I think the devil is in the details. So the first issue is that no one seems to agree on what clean eating actually means. And this has very practical implications. If you talk to your typical bodybuilder, they'll give you a short list of six or seven foods, something like chicken, egg whites, brown rice, sweet potato, oatmeal, and protein powder. And even with a list this short, you might already start to notice some contradictions. People say a main criterion of counting as clean is being unprocessed, whole, or natural. Yet protein powder almost always makes the list despite being very highly processed, refined, and synthetic. Oatmeal undergoes extensive processing as well. Now, even though it's still totally arbitrary, I can see why brown rice gets the clean label while white rice doesn't because white rice goes through some additional processing to mill out the bran and the germ, stripping away some B vitamins and fiber in the process. But then as pointed out in the mass write-up, it doesn't make sense why sweet potatoes get the clean label while white potatoes don't because neither sweet potatoes nor white potatoes are milled or processed. So it doesn't make sense for sweet potatoes to be any cleaner than white potatoes, other than the fact that the white color reminds people of white rice or white bread, which are more highly processed than their browner counterparts. In fact, white potatoes could be argued as being one of the best fat loss foods out there because of how incredibly satiating they are per calorie. One study found that when compared to other common carbohydrate sources, potatoes are by far the most satiating. So what counts as clean clearly depends on who you ask and what diet they follow. If you follow keto, you might say all carbs are dirty. If you follow paleo, you might say grains and dairy are bad, but meats and veggies are fine. And this is a problem because as Dr. Helm said in the latest mass review, if you tried to eat clean according to every group's definition, you'd have an empty plate. Now this might seem like I'm just nitpicking or playing semantics, but not being able to clearly define what the approach actually entails makes it hard to give dietary guidelines based on sound nutritional principles and can end up causing some pretty serious issues, as we'll see. So the second problem I noticed with clean eating, especially when it comes to fat loss, is that even if it technically works, which it can, it's still needlessly inconvenient. For most people, a true commitment to clean eating means you're not able to partake in special occasions or enjoy dinners with friends or family because what's on the menu is off limits. And that's kind of a shame because you can miss out on a lot of life for no reason since science tells us that it's perfectly fine to be flexible with your diet and enjoy a variety of foods, even some processed junk foods, and you'll still lose fat just as well, as long as you're in the same net caloric deficit over time and eating enough protein. In fact, it's actually better than that. Being more flexible with your diet isn't just good enough for fat loss. Research tells us that it's likely better than clean eating, which leads me to problem number three. Clean eating just isn't the most effective strategy for long-term fat loss for most people. One study from 2012 gave two groups the same diet, except one group wasn't allowed to eat bread and the other group was. Clean eaters, especially if they follow paleo or keto, might expect the group without bread to do better. But in reality, after 16 weeks, both groups lost the same amount of fat, but the group that was told to cut out the bread had way more subjects drop out partway through. They just couldn't stick to the diet as well. So over the long term, the more foods you make off limits, the harder it'll be to consistently follow through. This is supported by other research as well. For example, this study examined what they called flexible control versus rigid control. Flexible control basically means you're flexible with how you schedule your meals, you're flexible with your weight loss timeline, and you take a non-dichotomous view of foods. So you don't see foods as either good or bad or clean or dirty. Rigid control means the opposite. You have rigid timelines. You often try to diet as fast as possible. And you look at foods as being either good or bad. So there are foods you can eat and others that you can't. And as it turns out, flexible control was associated with lower body mass index, less binge eating, and better weight loss over a one year program. And then when the same researchers did a follow up three years later, they found that flexible control was better at maintaining weight loss after three years as well. And this shouldn't be surprising. The strictest clean eaters are pre-contest bodybuilders. 
And they're the perfect example of people who see cyclical, not sustainable weight loss. Almost without exception, bodybuilders will lose fat for several weeks leading up to a competition and then spend the rest of the year being at a higher body fat percentage. So even if we just ignore the research and look at the best anecdotes, clean eating still doesn't bode well for sustainable long-term fat loss. All right, the fourth issue with clean eating is that it can easily lead to disordered eating. Clean eating implies that if there are good foods, there must also be bad foods. And this is where it can start to go wrong for a lot of people psychologically. Research shows that black and white thinking about food can cause orthorexia, where you become obsessed with only eating foods you think are clean or healthy, and other potentially more severe eating disorders as well. In 2002, Stewart and colleagues found that rigid dieting strategies like clean eating, but not flexible dieting strategies, were associated with eating disorder symptoms. And a new paper from 2020 looking at how different eating patterns relate to binge eating in over 1,300 subjects found that inflexible eating beliefs and high rigid restraint were more likely to be associated with recurrent binge eating. Now that doesn't mean that so-called flexible dieting or if it fits your macros is a silver bullet either. Just because you track your macros and occasionally squeeze a Pop-Tart into your carb count doesn't mean you've immunized yourself from these potential psychological pitfalls. But just simply acknowledging that there really is no such thing as a bad food is a good place to start. As the Mass Review says, no food you eat, independent of the amount or frequency that you consume it, has a measurable negative effect on you. And junk foods that are high calorie, highly processed, highly palatable, and low in micronutrients are only problematic if they dominate your diet. And this brings me to the final problem that I see with clean eating. Even though it's touted as being extremely healthy, it probably isn't as healthy as you think. Now, to be clear, of course, there are foods that promote good health, like fruits and vegetables, and foods that, when eaten too much and too often, can lead to health problems, like ice cream and french fries. The thing clean eaters often miss is the fact that the dose always makes the poison. Even the most toxic and dangerous substance on Earth is only actually harmful at a given dose. And even water, the most essential component to life, will kill you at a high enough dose. And it's no different with ice cream and french fries. What really matters is how much of that junk food you're eating and what the rest of your diet looks like. And if maximizing your health is your main goal, extreme clean eating isn't the best solution. Depending on just how many foods you eliminate, you can easily run into nutrient deficiencies. This was shown in studies from Kleiner and colleagues, which found that male bodybuilders only hit 46% of the RDA for vitamin D, and women hit just 52% for calcium, while also being deficient in zinc, copper, and chromium. So unless you carefully monitor your vitamin and mineral intake, eliminating foods or food groups is an easy way to miss out on key nutrients for health. So with all those things in mind, what do I actually recommend? Well, first of all, I like Helms' suggestion that rather than excluding bad foods, focus more on including nutrient-dense foods. So yeah, do make an effort to eat more fruits, vegetables, grains, and healthy fats, but don't feel like you have to totally eliminate all junk foods or any specific foods from your diet. And that's true whether your main goal is health, fat loss, or both. Now, when it comes to fat loss, we know that there really aren't any magic fat-burning foods, except kiwis, just like there aren't any magic fat-storing foods. Ultimately, fat loss comes down to putting yourself in a net caloric deficit over time, and to a lesser extent, eating enough protein. People often try to mystify fat loss because it's more marketable when it's mysterious, but it really is that simple. Every diet that's ever succeeded at causing fat loss has one defining feature in common caloric deficit. So for some people, tracking caloric intake, protein intake, and optionally macronutrient intake, depending on how detailed you want to get, will be the best strategy. I personally periodically track my intake using an app like MyFitnessPal to make sure I'm in the right ballpark with my calories and my macros. In this way, if I want to fit some junk food in my diet that would be off limits on a clean eating plan, I can do that by just fitting it into my calorie or macro targets without compromising my results at all. But of course, it isn't the act of tracking that causes fat loss, and there are no magic macros either. It's simply one way of ensuring that you are in fact eating an appropriate number of calories for your goal. So you obviously don't need to track calories or macros to lose fat. It just works better at keeping some people on track while still allowing for flexibility and variety in the actual food choices. For others, a more auto-regulated approach will be just as or more effective without the same bother of having to track everything. Now, this is something I'd need a full video to do justice, so you guys can just let me know if that's something you'd like to hear me cover in more detail in the future. But very quickly, three things to focus on are prioritizing nutrient-dense, minimally processed whole foods, but not eliminating foods entirely. 
You wanna be more consistent with your meals, meaning you try to eat similar meals at similar times, while also being flexible enough to realize that it doesn't really matter if you miss a meal or if you eat something different occasionally. And then use a body scale and progress photos to track your progress over time. And I think I'm gonna leave it there for this one. If you guys would like a much more thorough breakdown of the practical elements of what I recommend for any goal, whether it be losing fat, building muscle, or doing both at the same time, I'd recommend checking out my 17 chapter Ultimate Guide to Body Recomposition, which I'll link down below. And as you can probably tell, a lot of the info in this video came from this month's issue of the Mass Research Review, which I'll leave an affiliate link to down below as well if you guys would like to check that out and help support me in the process. I would say the best way to stay up to date with the research on training and nutrition is to simply just subscribe to Mass. And you can also get there on my website. So if you go to jeffnipper.com, go to the affiliate tab and click on the Mass Research Review over there, and that'll get you there as well. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.